Hello and welcome to the Haaretz Podcast. I'm Alison Kaplan Summer in Tel Aviv. Israel is marking the one year anniversary of October 7th, a day when civilians and soldiers, Israelis and citizens of countries from around the world, were murdered in the surprise assault by thousands of Hamas terrorists from Gaza. Amid the national commemorations of loss and mourning, and arguments over those commemorations, the war that began on October 7th has not only continued but intensified and spread across the region as thousands of individual family members mourn their loved ones at the same time. Joining me on the podcast to talk about the mingling of individual grief, national loss, and international turmoil is Hannah Wacholder Katzman, whose son Chaim Katzman was killed on October 7th in Kibbutz Cholit. A member of the kibbutz, Chaim was a political scientist with a PhD from the University of Washington with a focus on religious Zionism in Israel. He was a passionate peace activist involved in groups like Breaking the Silence, and he volunteered in Bedouin communities in southern Israel. Hannah, thanks so much for joining us at the beginning of what's sure to be a challenging week for you. Thanks so much, Allison. So you've known this day, this anniversary has been coming up for a while. I'm sure your calendar is full of events of commemoration and remembrance in the days leading up to it. And in a normal world, it would be a day when you were focusing on your individual loss of Haim, but there's nothing normal about these times. So what's it like marking this day as events, as war, missile attacks continue to unfold around us? Do you feel like you're able to focus on remembering Haim? I remember the uh, Yom HaZikaron, the Israel Memorial Day for soldiers and victims of terror, and I wasn't prepared for it. Um, I started getting these messages about two weeks before. I'm thinking of you, so and so on. And it took me a little while to understand that it was connected to that. This was back in April, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, and it was very, very difficult, that whole period. Um, a lot of um, articles and uh, videos came out commemorating Chaim. Sometime in the summer, I realized, well, this is going to happen, you know, in October around the holidays, and it's going to be so much more intense. Um, so I was prepared in a way, and the it hasn't been as bad as I expected. There continues to be a lot of uh, events. We had some, we had a whole, there have been a whole series of memorials, some planned by me or the family and some by outsiders. Uh, there was uh, there's going to be an academic webinar on Tuesday, uh, next Tuesday on the 15th from the University of Washington about his academic legacy. Um, there's a uh, we had we went to the cemetery to mark 12 Hebrew months since the since the death. We uh, I had an event in my synagogue, uh, a study evening. Um, it was Chaim's birthday on. Uh, on October 3rd, and uh, and I don't check uh, social media during the holiday, so for three days I was offline, and I didn't, I would have been just thinking about the memorial events, and I, his birthday passed me by, and then when I turned on my computer, I saw messages from his friends um, for his birthday. How old would Chaim have been? 33. 33 years old. Yeah. What do you think about the politicization of the uh, of the mourning ceremony that some of the families of victims uh, refuse to participate in the official government commemoration? They're having their own alternative ceremony, you know, the, given their feelings about the government. Does that bother you? I have been out of that. I haven't been a part of that conversation at all. I'm going to a memorial for the members of Chaim's Kibbutz. I, you know, I really, I, I wasn't invited to anything official. I kind of knew about the controversy, but um, I understand it. Uh, but that is something, that's one debate I stayed out of. I think Chaim was the first victim of October 7th that I wrote about at the time, given that I follow you on social media. So I knew at first that he was missing and you were waiting for mm -hmm. information about him. Um, right. Can you tell us, first of all, 
about who Chaim was and about his life. I've really admired the fact that you've been open about some of the contradictions and conflicts in his life, in your relationship, and haven't just painted him with a simple brush. And I think it's allowed people to feel closer to Chaim and uh, and closer to you. I mean, starting with you, you moved to Israel and gave birth to Chaim not long after you moved here, right? Chaim was, um, was born a year and a half after my oldest son, who was born in the U.S., Right after uh, my mother died, uh, right after we made Aliyah in 1990, right before the Gulf War. Uh, it was one of the rainiest winters. I remember they had to open the floodgates in, on the Kinneret because it was over full. So Chaim and my older son I, and I were home a lot. Um, and he was a delightful child. He was smiling and funny. And uh, and as he got older, he was had always had a lot of friends. He was an excellent student, really admired by teachers, always curious and asked questions they couldn't answer sometimes. He was philosophical. Uh, you know, he was interested in questions about God and um and he liked to argue a lot as he got older. Uh he argued with us, he argued with his siblings. You know, but he was, you know, really identified by his teachers as being quite brilliant. You know, he was identified as uh, gifted. And uh, some of my other children also passed this exam for gifted children. And they had, in religious schools, they had a program once a week on Fridays, uh, which, you know, my other kids enjoyed because they, uh, you know, didn't have to do boring schoolwork. And they, you know, had interesting activities. But Chaim, he resisted going. He really liked to be with his friends from school. And, and I think that held through as he got older and he eventually lived on the kibbutz, you know, even though he was an academic and he had a doctorate and he wanted, he really wanted an academic career. But he wanted to live on Kholit with, uh, with p- people from all backgrounds. It was important to him. He seemed to bridge so many worlds, right? That he grew up religious, he became less religious, but then his academic focus was uh, was religious life and, and settlers and, uh, and, and right-wing politics. Um, and he lived on the kibbutz. And uh, I believe you told me at one point that, uh, that his dissertation was based on interviews that he was doing with, uh, with people when he was working in a garage. So it just seemed like he lived a very eclectic life. Yes, and uh, someone mentioned one of the things that was uh, unique about him was that because that he was an insider and that he understood the national religious community, and he was able in this uh, in his research to um, to talk about the nuances within the community because you know most of the people who were writing on the religious Zionist community were in it, mm-hmm. and they had their own, you know, agenda, like they wanted things to change within the community. And Chaim understood the community, but he was an outsider already. And he was able to look at it from a different point of view, thanks to his academic work, you know, his his academic studies. You know, many of the people who were writing about it from the outside, they saw it as one block. And Chaim understood the nuances. And that was unique. I know it's painful for you probably to uh, discuss, but um, do you have a clear picture of what happened to him on October 7th? I don't know if I have a clear picture, but um, I understand that he was, um, the one thing I don't know is if he, you know, he was on the advance guard and he was therefore designated as a fallen soldier. I do not know if he put on a uniform in the morning. He did not have a gun because he had given the gun his gun back for safekeeping. Was he he had been on a long trip to India over the summer, and he'd only gotten back a week or two before. And they had made new regulations about a safe, and they hadn't provided one for him. Someone said just bureaucracy. So he didn't have a weapon. Obviously, we can't know if that would have changed the situation. Was, but um, at one point he. So he was mostly in his house, and then at one point he did go out, and he saw, he reported that he saw one of the neighbors on the street, went to a different neighbor, and he saw some blood on the floor, which turned out to be blood of a dog who had been sick, but the neighbor was hiding 
on the roof. He hid upstairs, up on the roof for 12 hours until the army rescued him. Nobody knew what happened to him. Um, and then he went to his neighbor next door, who'd only been living there for a few months, Avital, uh, was afraid to be by herself. So he went to her house and they climbed into a closet in her safe room. From what she described, he, she he pushed her deeper into the closet and um, they shot through the closet. I actually was there recently uh, supervising the packing of all of his things. We saw where they had uh, you know, shot through the doors. And you had a very long um, day and night waiting for information. I mean, again, like we, we relatively short, really, for us, it was relatively short. The, um, we got official notice from the kibbutz around 1 a.m. So then, and then the police notified us around four in the morning. Before this tragedy struck, you were a long time public figure, activist for women's rights in Israel, also involved in American politics. And a lot of people might have simply retreated during this time of mourning, but you've been quite active, not just memorializing Chaim, but also pursuing the causes that you care about, um, adding to it, I guess, advocating for hostage families. What's your view in general of how the two countries, Israel and America, has handled the aftermath of October 7th and uh, the ensuing war? Well, as I've said, I felt I got a lot more support from the U.S. government. I, we never heard from, um, you know, none of the government members have come to, you know, came to any of our events or the Shiva funeral or called. Um, I got the only thing we got. We did get many things from other public officials through the army, through the president wrote a wonderful letter. Um, but um, the only thing I've heard from the government is about four months after the war started, we got a letter from a form letter from the prime minister that was clearly the same letter that goes out to all of the parents of soldiers since the war started. And I think some, it felt to me like someone said, oh, yeah, we better send to the soldiers who were killed on October 7th, too, if we're sending out to the soldiers in it you know, to the families of the soldiers in Aza. So, um, yeah, so it's been pretty silent. And, um, you know, and there's just been a lot of hostility toward hostage families and toward uh, peace activists like my son. Um, and it's very, and, and toward people who, are, who want a hostage deal, you know, which will include some kind of ceasefire. And, and, and whatever I've been screamed at, at events, you know, I go to when I can. You talk, you say it's interesting. You say I'm an activist. I'm certainly cut way, way, way back. I spend most of my time, uh, my spare time in uh, memorials having to do with Chaim. It's an enormous amount of work. I mean, I've not required to do all of it. I've taken a lot of it on voluntarily, but um, I've had less time to to be an activist than I did before. Um, I try to go to to events when I can, you know, but there I have faced hostility or, or comments. You know, people have implied there was one influencer early on, the end of October, who said that um, an American, you know, who said how, how people don't know that most of the people who lived in the Gaza envelope were progressives. <laughs> and uh, and then she named some by name, including Chaim, and it was just so offensive. Like I saw in Haaretz, someone said, uh, you know, some one of the writers said that um, soon they're going to say the hostages kidnapped themselves. And I identified with that because people really are saying things like that, that Chaim brought it on himself, as if he invited all of these terrorists into his house. And... Um, you know, because he was a peace activist, and first of all, Chaim was a political scientist, so he knew very well what Hamas, uh, what Hamas uh, believes, and what they what their goal is. And second, he he wasn't in charge. <laughs> you know, I mean, this right wing government was in charge, so wasn't it their job to prevent it? I don't. It's just really, but people don't, you know, but they want to blame 
they want to blame the victims and it's uh it's really galling so with all of the private and communal support that i've had over this year which has been enormous 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 um publicly there's still this and sometimes it seeps through into my private life also this attitude as someone who made Aliyah to Israel as a Zionist, moved your life here, committed to the country. Do you feel disappointed? Do you feel let down at this point by the reaction of um, Israel's leaders and citizens, some of them, to uh, to what you've been through? Um, I, I'm disappointed by the callousness show toward the hostages and, and off it. To, to some extent toward us, the families, but especially toward the hostage families. That to me is unfathomable, unbelievable, hurtful, um, painful. Um, with all that's going on, have you had any bandwidth to follow what's going on in America regarding the presidential race? You've been a very um, passionate Democrat. Do you have any feelings about Biden-Harris versus Trump? And Yes, I do. I mean, I saw a headline just now that said that um, Harris could lose because of uh, Gaza. And, and of course, the Republicans in Israel that I've seen, they're talking about how Harris is going to be, you know, is going to sell out Israel. And but in America, we see that the the most militant uh, pro uh, Palestinians, even pro Hamas, are they can't stand her and they aren't voting for her. Whereas, you know, one thing that we've seen in this uh, election is how the Democrats have surprisingly (laughs) been unified around her and uh, this one group isn't. So, um, but, so, you know, you have this contradiction here. Uh, Now, I certainly know, I think they understand that the, uh, attitude toward Israel is changing. It's not the same as it was a generation or two ago, and certainly not in the Jewish community. And that's a reality, uh, you know, that's going to be reflected in in the elections. But um, I don't think we have any, uh, I don't think that moving the embassy like Trump did is turned out to be anything, uh, have any significance. And um, to vote based on that, when we see all of the other extremely, extremely troubling things that Trump has been saying about Jews, about and in general his uh, his his crazed there's no other way to describe them his crazed and demented rants at at rallies. This isn't someone we want in charge of the country. It's not going to be good for. For Israel, it's not going to be good for anyone in this U.S. goes down. <laughs> We're down with it. I mean, it's it's a really really scary situation to me. So yes, it's it's scary anyway. We we don't know what will happen when there's a new administration. But um, to me, there's simply no question. I mean, Kamala Harris has shown herself to be a strong supporter of Israel. And, uh, you know, she sh- she's shut down protests. She's, you know, been very clear. Hannah, back to Chaim, back to October 7th. Um, I know so many people feel for you and are standing with you right now in Israel, Jews, non-Jews abroad. To wrap this up on a positive note, what are the moments of the past year that you felt the most supported and what can people continue to do, in your view, to best honor Chaim and the other people that were lost on October 7th? I think we've had some type of memorial event for Chaim almost every month um, through his various, you know, through, whether it was through the kibbutz at the 30-day mark, um, at Michal at Hadassah, where he taught a course in political philosophy. Um, we had a moving event with uh, the head of of the department started a scholarship and um, he asked the scholarship participants to make a video. So they made a video. He interviewed me and a few of Chaim's friends and neighbors about his life. And I don't know, there were 150 people. They're mostly students. And afterward, they passed around the microphone and the students who had 
studied with him, talked about what they remembered about his meditation, that he he uh, started each class with five minute meditation. Anyway, just all of these events where uh, people are remembering his life and talking about him. It's I found those really meaningful. As I said, I, I get a lot of messages all the time. Just got a message today from one of my father's students. My, my father was a um, a professor at Hebrew Union College, Ben Sion Vacholder. He had a student that used to come to our house. My father had low vision and the graduate students would come to our house and, and help him with his research. And the student's also now a professor. And he wrote to me today that he just finished his conversion. He was a Mennonite. Many of the my father's graduate students were uh, from various Christian communities who wanted to understand Hebrew texts better. My father taught Talmud and later on um, became uh, a scholar of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And um, so he told me he just completed his uh, his conversion to Judaism and three of the four non jewish students that were my father's primary assistants were have converted to Judaism. So I don't know what that says, but you know, but he told me he'd been thinking about Chaim. He wrote something. He'd been in Israel a few months after October 7th and had written about it. So, um, yeah, so I talked about that. Uh, all of these moving uh, messages that I'm getting and um, that, you know, bring the sadness and also a little bit of comfort at the same time. Hannah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking to us and, um, you know, <laughs> stay strong during this week and uh, may Chaim's memory be a blessing. Thank you. And that wraps things up for the Haaretz podcast. Thanks to my guest, Hannah Katzman, and to my producer and editor, Avri Rosensvi. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to the podcast on your platform of choice. And don't forget to subscribe and follow Haaretz.com for all the latest news on Israel, the Middle East, and the Jewish world. And if you are a subscriber, or if you subscribe now, Haaretz.com currently features a special in-depth video project marking a year since the events of October 7th. It includes interviews with survivors of that traumatic and historic day. And you can also join our Zoom on October 14th, on which Haaretz reporters are going to talk about what it was like covering October 7th and the Gaza War. Until next time, I'm Alison Kaplan-Summer and Shalom from Tel Aviv.